What's up guys, we're here for another Overly Sarcastic Productions video and this one is History Makers Anna Comnia. Um, yeah. So this is going to be a good video. Don't really know a lot about this person, but um, it should be pretty good because uh, yeah, we get to learn a little bit about them and um, you know, watch an Overly Sarcastic Productions video like, uh, like we always should do. But yeah. Um, you can recommend me videos in the comment section down below if you have any suggestions, so any videos that you want me to watch, and also subscribe to the channel. Um, yeah, let's get into it and play. Has a well-deserved A plus in art class, but their written work is a little meh. Thing is, most Byzantine literature reads like a modern textbook. Sure, it's informative, but the writing is drier than chalk dust, and it could stand to lose a couple hundred pages, too. But there's one defiant Byzantine historian out there who did something, plot twist, cool. We've already seen narrative history on this show, as well as political analysis and epic poetry, but the Byzantine princess Anna Komnena mixed things up by writing an epic history, recounting the reign of her father, Emperor Alexios Komnenos, in the style of an epic poem. And if that wasn't rad enough already, Anna Komnena also happens to be the first woman historian. Hell yeah! So, to see why Anna is such a fascinating character within Byzantine history, and to understand why her work represents everything that Byzantine literature could have and should have been, let's do some history. In many ways, Anna Komnena was a typical Byzantine princess. Born in the Purple Room of the Royal Palace in Constantinople, she was the eldest daughter of Emperor Alexios, and first in line to succeed him. So her early years saw lots of tutoring and imperial training, from music and courtly etiquette to theology, medicine, and a little smidge of philosophy. But aside from studying and entertaining the occasional dignitary, the average young Byzantine royal didn't really do all that much. However, Anna was not a typical Byzantine princess, as she was an extraordinary student with a remarkable eye for literature. She regularly hounded her tutors for treatises on astronomy, military strategy, history, rhetoric, and mathematics, plus any loose Aristotle within a hundred mile radius. Mm. But for all the schooling her parents gave her, and believe me, it was probably the best curriculum either side of 500 years, there was still one more thing she wanted to learn about. Since the Byzantine Empire was pretty firmly Christian, classical literature was taboo to read on account of all of the paganism. Scholars had called it dangerous for men, and especially insidious for women. Whatever that is supposed to mean. <laughs> but as far as Anna was concerned, those were wimpy excuses for dumb idiot quitters, so she snuck copies of Homer's epics out of the Imperial Library and read them in secret. You go, Anna. Even among her, let's say, less than female empowering contemporaries, she was recognized as devoted to philosophy, the queen of all sciences, and educated in every field. That's high praise. But even with the best library in the world on tap, Anna made like a Disney princess and started looking for ways to get out of the palace. So her father built a 10,000 bed hospital and orphanage specifically so that Anna could administer it. There she also wrote entire medical treatises, likely taught some of the doctors of the hospital, and possibly... Byzantine medicine was extremely well regarded. Their preservation of and innovation on ancient techniques were essential to later development of Islamic and Renaissance medicine. Hmm served as a physician herself. We do know that Anna was her father's primary caretaker during the last years of his reign, so she clearly got the practice somewhere. All right, so it's no secret that Anna Komnena was a genius polymath, you know, casual, no sweat. But the other reason she's a unique princess is because her father was a unique emperor. Alexios came to power at a bad time to put it mildly. The Byzantines had lost a casual half of their empire a decade earlier, and the ensuing civil wars were obviously less than fun. In the mid-1070s, Alexios was a general in the Byzantine army, playing whack a traitor against an array of rebelling governors and mercenaries in western Greece. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, Alexios's mother, Anna de la Cini, was playing politics to convince the aristocrats that Alexios was the cataphract's pajamas and should totally be the next emperor. With a silver tongue and an improbable amount of nat 20s on her persuasion checks, she bought Alexios the time and resources he needed to swoop right onto the imperial throne. Good work, team. From there, Alexios began arguably the hardest of hard carries in Byzantine history. With enemies clawing at every border, half of the empire gone, potential usurpers behind every corner, and a treasury collecting more cobwebs than coins, Alexios's restoration of Byzantine stability and prosperity over his 37-year reign was borderline miraculous. Under Alexios, the empire campaigns tirelessly against invading Normans, Turks, and Pechenegs. So far from a quiet upbringing in a chilled-out Constantinople, Anna's early years were 
set against a backdrop of constant political chaos, though during her father's reign she would prove extremely attentive to the imperial goings-on. But despite all the wars and chaos, the most significant challenge to Anna's ambitions would come from her younger brother. In 1092, John Komnenos was designated by Alexios as the... As firstborn child, Anna was set for a throne, but after first son John survived infancy, Alexios turned it over to him. Ah... Uh... The imperial heir, bumping Anna right out of the succession order. This, understandably, made Anna feel quite cheated out of her imperial birthright. So during Alexios's final years, Anna and her mom Irene tried to persuade him not to hand John the crown, but Alexios wouldn't budge. Supposedly, Anna was planning to assassinate John and throw a coup, but the plan failed because her mother and her husband Nikephorus were too skittish to go along. Which doesn't even make sense to me. You're a Byzantine royal. If you don't have a spine for a little coup d'etat, what are you even doing here? <laughs> Ugh. Anyway, Anna was eventually found out and swiftly banished from the palace by John. When Anna's husband died two years later... Our sources for Anna's palace exile are sparse. Anna herself hardly mentions the time after Alexios' death. And the sources we do have are vague. So we basically have no clue what happened. I mean, what large portions of her life looked like. Only, get, only guesses. Okay. Later, John confined her to the Kekaritomini Monastery in Constantinople. There, Anna spent the last 35 years of her life with her library and her mind, dutifully composing what would become the masterwork of her whole empire, the Alexiad. This book is so impressive because it's not only a detailed account of Alexios's reign, which is already one of the most complex periods in Byzantine history, but it's also an entire epic poem. She wrote beautifully in the Attic dialect of ancient Greek, and never misses an opportunity to slip in a casual 1,500-year-old reference to someone like Sophocles or Thucydides. As an example, just listen to the first paragraph of the prologue, where she describes the extremely simple concept of people forget things when time passes. <clears throat> Time, which flies irresistibly and perpetually, sweeps up and carries away with it everything that has seen the light of day and plunges it into utter darkness, whether deeds of no significance or those that are mighty and worthy of commemoration. Then there's a quick Sophocles quote, Nevertheless, the science of history is a great bulwark against the stream of time. In a way, it checks this irresistible flood. It holds in a tight grasp whatever it can see is floating on the surface and will not allow it to slip away into the depths of oblivion. Then she gives her literary resume in which she quantifies reading all of Aristotle and Plato as some acquaintance with literature. Mm. So, safe to say, the princess knew her way around a quill and paper. At the risk of turning this video into a Komnena quote fest, and believe me, I could, I'm gonna pivot off the epic writing style, but rest assured that all of the history in this book reads like silk. The other of Anna's defining characteristics is her perspective. It's as far from a dry, detached look at history as can be, because she was there when a lot of the stuff was going down. Anna was a teenager during the First Crusade. She describes meeting with the kings of Europe. She describes how she was not particularly impressed. And when Anna isn't working from her own experience in the royal court, she had access to prior historical works, official reports, treaties and archive documents, eyewitness accounts from battles, recorded speeches, plus the emperor's own recollection. Very few Byzantine historians could boast a bibliography that stacked. Alright, so now let's look at what Anna actually recounts in her Alexiad. The work is split into 15 books plus a preface. One through three describe Alexios during the revolts and civil wars, from his time as a general up through his ascension to the throne. After his coronation, books four through nine are damage control, as Alexios wages war against the invading Normans to the west, Pechenegs to the north, and Seljuk Turks to the east. But then, just as things are starting to calm down, the pious armies of Europe arrive to save the day. By which, I mean the bandit hordes take two steps into an empire that's shinier than theirs and immediately start stealing things. As you might have guessed, books 10 and 11 are about the Crusades. After dodging that two-ton wrecking ball, books 12 through 14 describe even more conflicts with the Normans and assorted other enemies. And finally, book 15 wraps the tale with a sorrowful account of Alexios's death and Anna's grief. Anna's monumental devotion to her father for all that tragic pathos is also where the Alexiad runs into trouble. On a purely factual level, Anna misplaces some dates and whiffs a battle here and there, but Anna's most consistently criticized for her nearly spotless praise of her father. And since the Alexiad leans more towards the first portion of Alexios's reign, we're left wondering if maybe the second half wasn't as great of a time. And those are valid points. It's important to recognize source bias in every historical document, but it's also good to understand what we can gain by a fundamentally biased account. Anna gives us a vivid and rare picture of the Byzantine world from a royal perspective, and she helps us read her work critically because she doesn't mince words. She thought her dad was the coolest dude, and she thought that the Europeans were a bunch of gold
old hungry morons. And let's be honest here, her representative sample size was crusaders. Of course she thought the Byzantines were better in literally every way. Now, for some scholars, this all raises the question of whether the Alexiad is more a piece of literature or more of a history. But I'd say that that balance is exactly what makes Anna's work so special. Despite the vast literary catalog... You would think that a culture which inherits the legacies of Homer, uh, Thucydides, and Sophocles, um, Plutarch, Virgil, Seneca, Augustine, and others would have produced some, uh, some work of similar quality of medieval and classical Greece all available on tap, Byzantine authors weren't being particularly <laughs> inventive with any of it. So in an empire where history was plain and literature was long-winded, Anna flipped the script by taking the best of both, combining the personal significance of history and the elegant stylings of epic poetry into something completely new but still distinctly Byzantine. Anna's account of Alexios evokes the image of a classical epic hero while... Anna simultaneously pulls tropes and techniques from ancient ep epic poetry, all, all the way to medieval Christian hagiography, a genre of biography for, for saints. Okay. Seamlessly pulling tropes from Greek hagiography to paint Alexios as a pious and saintly emperor. The Alexiad is so damn cool because it builds on so many wildly diverse aspects of Greek writing across the entire 2000 year span. So that's what I mean when I say that this is what Byzantine literature could have and should have been. But all's well, it's gonna be okay, as we've seen before and we'll see again, this is hardly the most tragic screw up in Byzantine history. That honor would go to Byzantine history. But even if the Alexiad is a lone triumphant in a sea of medieval meh, Anna undeniably earned her place alongside Greece's greatest writers. And not to hammer the point too finely, but Greek literature is a sausage fest, so Anna Komnena is clearly an odd one out here. In celebrating her as the first woman historian, it's important to recognize how hard she worked to get her education, as well as why she only wrote the Alexiad because she got screwed out of her throne. It's easy to lessen her story to just, princess wanted to be empress, failed, got mad, sulked, and then wrote a history about it. And historians like Edward Gibbon have famously done exactly that. And in case the point wasn't quite clear, he also made sure to trash her as jealous, manic, and full of the female vanity. Ah. That's a quote. Even if we're not being a colossal knobend about it, however, Anna's work does have distinctly feminine characteristics, which she openly acknowledges. Anna's perspective on history is much more personal and emotive than the straight-laced works of her all-male peers. Their man histories for macho men were expected to be stoic and aloof because that was the manly thing to do. So Anna actively leaned into certain gender conventions in order to break out of restrictive authorial conventions. And so, two millennia after Homer and some 1500 years post Herodotus, Greece got its first epic poet historian in Anna Komnena. Step up your game, boys. Thank you all so much for watching and also... Pretty good, pretty good um, to learn about Anna Komnena. And um, yeah, so um, talk to you guys in the next video. Also subscribe to the channel. Want to get down subscribers by Valentine's Day. And uh, yeah, so let's get into... Um, yeah, let's get... I mean, I'll talk to you guys in the next video, and uh, you can also suggest me videos in the comment section down below. And yeah, talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.